When you go to level one, you're amongst your peers of people who have a, a similar interest level in what you're doing as you. And they might be all into the anatomy and physiology, but you have to know that most of your members are there to get sweaty, socialize and have a good time. Mm. They don't really truly care about that stuff. So, you know, having the range is important, but you have to know the application and the audience and when it is time to do that. And more often than not, your average affiliate member is a casual CrossFitter. They come in three days a week and just want to sweat and have a good workout. What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Misfit Podcast. We have got a, eh, it's kind of special. It's just kind of a, Damn. it's a normal. He's right there. He's two normal, feet away from you. It's a normal special edition. Mark's been on the podcast enough it's that it's not time. special anymore. Season yeah. bet. No one That's fucking right. cares anymore, Mark. I'm um, <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, we are, we're going to kick a coach's podcast episode today while Drew is um, still out of pocket. Hopefully there will be a smaller version of him in the very, very near future, but um, all seems to be going well there. Uh, but, we really have to start the podcast with a snack chat uh, conversation. And this, no, like Mark's four hour bike ride snack chat? Well, it's actually about Mark's post four hour bike ride snack. Uh, I thought that was for chat. during the bike. No? That pancake crumble cookie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that shit was <laughs> fucking good. I had one of those. Did you have one? Yeah, I sure yeah. did. So that one was mine. Last week, I got like I got trapped into a four pack. So here's the thing. Trapped. So, yeah. You were well, so sad so about it. So here's the thing. Like we'll uh, like we'll go and I'll get like shoot for like one for each of us that we that we one like. One for you, um, three for me. Yeah. And then it's like, well, there's usually a third one that's like, oh, God, I really kind of want to fuck around and taste and get a try this one. <laughs> occasionally there is a fourth cookie where you're like, uh, like I feel like I need to try this one as well. You really only want to try it. You don't need the entire cookie, but you want to fuck try just it. tries a cookie. Well, what the fuck? <laughs> so, well, so then, so, so one day I went in, I was just like, I'm going to get three single cookies. And after like I ordered that, he was like, you know, it's, 10 cents more for, a is that all it is? Pack, 10 cents right? more it's for ten, four? It's like 10 cents. It's Genius. like, it's something, yeah, it's like, I don't, have a, I don't have a dime. Sorry. Yeah. yeah like, no, I don't have a dime. And <laughs> you're just like, it. God fucking damn it. Like, you know, you don't need that cookie, but it's like fiscally irresponsible to not spend an extra 10 cents for 500 additional calories. Grandma just went like, through the great depression. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exa <laughs> exactly. Think about grandma. She so, couldn't afford that cookie back then. So we dropped the four pack. Cents. I sent it to Mark. What did I, did I what did I send to you? No, did I just you send just, you a picture you just posted or a story I just posted the story <laughs> and I was like I had just basically I had just crushed one of those things and almost out of like pure ecstasy passed out while driving. You know, I was <laughs> while like, driving? Oh yeah. Like, that sounds dangerous. Like, yeah, Mark, was, don't go to Mark. Unreal. Unreal. Mark your pants. So I, I saw it and I just replied to it but I had like I, Caroline's probably going to roll her eyes, but I had smashed a whole package of Swedish fish. That's what size package though? Like let's be, it was, let's, you know, it was like accurate a, for the people. Uh, it was eight servings. That's what I remember. And, uh, it actually, it actually worked out great because it was the first time I'd ever done like an endurance event that was multiple hours, like multiple hours of continuous. Now, I don't want to derail snack chat, but you want to, would, would you were four hour ride? Yeah. So, um, this, right this guy that came up, we, uh, rode <laughs> 61 it? miles and, uh, it was a four hour total time and moving time was three hours and 46 so I was in my seat pedaling and the whole goal was continuous pedaling. So like no coasting, like mm. if we're going downhill, still like, move the pedals, like pull up a gear so that you can hammer down that hill. And it was the first time I was doing like uh, 25 to 60 grams of carbs, like every hour. Mm. And I could just, I could just go forever. It was like quite the experience to determine, you know, in I'm, I'm trying to do a triathlon yeah. and they say that the fourth discipline <laughs> is nutrition. And it was the first time that I set out to do, cause the thing I want to do is like a six or seven hour event. Um, it was the first time that like, I felt like I nailed it. Like I wasn't that tired. I was forcing myself to eat like 20 to 60 grams of carbs. And I just chose Swedish fish. How many so, Swedish fish is that? So that's, so one serving of Swedish fish, if I can remember, is five Swedish fish. And there was eight servings. And I was probably gobbering down like seven or eight at a time. Nice. Like, 
almost nah, vomit, like real, trying to real quick how does that compare to the uh cliff bar energy gel cubes that you and i put down during the marathon and half marathon run this past october much better about the same or um like more from like an enjoyment standpoint because those fucking cubes no, by the end of that race dude, suck no <laughs> the cu- from an enjoyment standpoint i think the cubes were better mm. Because, like, if you try and hammer, like, seven Swedish fish, like, while moving, Don't you're tell me basically, a good time. like, sticking the handful in your mouth. Your mouth shut. Like, you know, you got, like, cemented <laughs> Swedish <laughs> fish to your teeth. You're, like, trying to get your water bottle out while you're, like, riding a bike. And it's so um, I'm going to go with Swedish fish moving forward because it was the best I'd have ever felt for mm. a multiple hour event. Um, but the, the little cubes we did were just absolute money. Oh man, I'm so sorry. I haven't had one of those since. Not that I've done any sort of running anywhere near that volume since yeah, the yeah. marathon. What was fuck. your hydration protocol? Did you have a similar like so, sodium, um, pat- I used water? a uh, proper fuel. Use code mark. No, there's no <laughs> code mark, but uh, <laughs> I use proper uh, whatever we call it. The hydrate. Yep. Um, I had one water bottle filled with that. And then I have to be super careful with magnesium because if I tip the scale on that, I if if you're listening and you've taken too you much know. magnesium, you know what happens. <laughs> you know. To you. So I just had one bottle. What happens? Of that. I don't. I don't actually just know. The, <laughs> I don't know if I want to say uh, it here, but okay. I you went can to say the, it. I went to the bathroom in my pants. <laughs> 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 like, like I just, I had uh, one, give like, the people the content yeah. they want, Mark. <laughs> just too, <laughs> like, just too much, and I thought it was okay. <laughs> it wasn't okay. I knew what happened. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and then I just had two other water bottles, like in my jersey, uh, and it probably wasn't enough. It wasn't enough water, but like. I'm learning the skill of like, can I reach down and grab my water bottle while keeping like a decent Cadence, pace? Yeah. Can I like not feel like I'm going to die while drinking it? Can I get my water <laughs> bottle back in? That is interesting. That makes sense as that being, cause I've like certainly never that long, but probably like an hour and a half, maybe like yeah. longest time and uh, I've spent. And it's like, those little things do kind of add up. And oh, it's yeah. like any, like anybody who's, tried to drink water or do something while like actually moving whether it's running or biking it's like it's like you have that brief moment where you think you're gonna die because your heart rate jumps up to like 217 oh so, it, it jumps up like, like 50 beats crazy <laughs> for yeah. like literally bending that's down grabbing, yeah, even even like water. a maffetone session like bending over taking the sip like all of a sudden you're holding tension in weird places yeah. and um Damn, that's cool magnesium who right. thunk? What before you we go too far what did oh. you get with your four pack of flavors because Having seen your uh, story, it yeah. might have inspired me in a way that it probably shouldn't have inspired pancake. me to also get four cookies. Pancake. So. It was the pancake. It was the, well, this was last week. I'd say. So, oh, same. okay. Pancake. Yeah, right pancake, after you did. The cookies and cream milkshake. The uh, strawberry cupcake, which is not my God. My we're three for three right now. Decision. And we're the last one was the nerds. Nah, you I didn't go nerd. that one. Nah, What'd nah. You get? I went the chocolate chip one, the chocolate chocolate one. one. Yeah, Yeah. that's the only difference. And then the same three that you got. And um, I didn't share them with anybody else in case anyone's wondering. I am a scumbag and ate all four by myself. Housed. Wow. (laughs) That's that's pretty disgusting. (laughs) This is my my therapy session. It's between uh, 2,000 and 2,200 calories and just one fucking... The problem is that's an easy 2,000 count. Like you I can, was disturbed with how fast I went through four cookies, and then yeah. I was like, I could probably eat like two more of these yeah. things. Is, oh, yeah, fuck. degenerate. That's what my, I am. My tummy would hurt <laughs> oh, so bad. The next two days were not enjoyable at all. Oh, okay. But all the right, eight minutes I had of eating cookies. <laughs> See, it was well <laughs> worth it. Were, well worth, well two worth days. it. <laughs> oh, man. That pancake one, though, was that. It was good. I yeah, it was, was the best, like, that was the best that was one top. I've ever had. I had, a couple, I had a couple responses to that, too. You spread that buttery shit on top around. Or did you just nubble, like fucking eat it all at once? No, I did. Well, no, That's I didn't. I did not. Idea. I did not spread it around. Not that either. is a great idea. Should have. Um, I, I literally it. just took like the whole bite. ball. And one <laughs> yeah, fuck yeah, bite, dude. Oh fuck, it was a little much. <laughs> so good. Yeah. You got any snack chats, Sherb? Or was that that? How's me and <laughs> admitting my snack chat cookie, right now yeah. that I saw your story? I was like, fuck. I yeah. can go for four cookies. No, all goes to bed in like 15 minutes. She won't mind. <laughs> yeah. Leave him on the doorstep. Don't ring my doorbell. Baby's asleep. <laughs> Fuck. All right. Um, so today we're gonna we're gonna chat about a. This is a topic that you actually idea that you came up with, Sherb, and I think that works well because it's something that Mark is exceptionally good at. Um, but we're gonna 
more so in the context of affiliate class, but honestly, I'm going to ask the question about whether that differs based on who you're communicating with. But it's the idea of when you're in class as a coach, there's a lot of value in keeping <clears throat> things as simple as possible from an explanation standpoint. So whether that's explaining something at the whiteboard, explaining the intricacies of movement, um, regardless of what it is, uh, there are, I would classify myself as someone who likes to maybe over explain or at least uh, maybe explain at a level of detail that's either not useful to slightly advanced. uh, That's yeah. That's maybe more advanced than the individual that I'm speaking to or um, just, it just all of a sudden people kind of tune out. Right. And it's like, People, we've talked about the people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, that sort of thing. But this is more about the actual kind of teaching of movement and like correcting things and trying to get athletes to do basically what you want them to do um, under the guise of like how simple how simple can we make this? Yeah, the um, correct me if my timeline is wrong, Mark, because I'm trying to remember back. It's about three years ago when I first got to see you coaching. I right around three years ago, and one of the things that we did pre pandemic at our affiliate is we had a sober Sunday class. So basically, anybody in the recovery community could come work out for free at our gym at like nine a.m. on a Sunday. Um, it's very similar to our free community class that we ran every Saturday. And, but the idea was like this is specifically for that community. And at this point, I don't believe Mark was coaching classes regularly. He was just kind of a transplanting member from a former gym to a new gym and was just trying to get, you know, into the culture, into the people uh, in terms of like knowing who's Easy, in the yeah, it's a family yeah. establishment. All right. here. Getting to know people and figuring out like what makes them tick. And, you know, he volunteered himself as someone with a level one to come help out in that class. And if I remember correctly, we were teaching kettlebell deadlifts with a single kettlebell. So basically like a sumo deadlift. And one of the things that Mark said, he said, I want to see an angry gorilla. And it was a sandbag. Was it was a sandbag? All right, maybe it was a sandbag. So he, Mark said, I want to see an angry gorilla. And instantly everybody in the room, like head went up, like a dog heads tilt, and then immediately knew exactly what he was asking for. And like in that moment, I was like, man, that's a great way to describe that movement. Everyone knows what a gorilla looks like. Everyone's seen a cartoon of a gorilla or a real gorilla knows what that pose looks like everybody's hips are low, knees are out, chest is up. It looks like, you know, an infant squatting. And all of a sudden everyone's in a very safe position to do a movement that could be very dangerous if you don't know how to do it correctly. And I was like, man, that is a great skill to have, to be able to communicate with a group of people who have almost no context. I don't know how many people in that group exercise regularly, but I would, I would guess probably about 25%. But I'd say he got 95% adherence to everybody in the room with that cue. And I was like, damn, that is super valuable. And it's something that you could teach other people to do because figuring out movement analogies that make someone's mind instantly click to like, all right, this is what I want in a way that's not like, I need you to externally rotate your big toe and make sure your pronators are turned on. Like, what the fuck are you saying? Like speak in plain English. And I was like, that is super valuable. So I don't know if that comes from a background anything else that you've done before, or it's just like, Hey man, this is how it makes sense to me. So that's how I say it to them. Like what, where do you think those things come from? Those, that idea to like simplify it, but make it obvious to the uh, audience. Yeah. I think it's a little bit of just like a natural (laughs) ability that I have. Like it's just in, in my professional career like I've always been kind of like a people manager so like explaining and communicating but um, as it applies to CrossFit it was totally just like having a strong desire but having to be self-taught so like if I'm telling you something it's not because someone told me that that's the right way to do it it's because like I felt that right like I, I could envision and so that's what like years probably two or three years of Olympic lifting and primarily Olympic lifting, but some CrossFit, like no one was telling me the right thing to do. So to then regurgitate, cause you see that a lot, like, you know, not to throw shade at like CrossFit coaches out there, but like they're delivering a message that is because someone had told them that's how you do it. Mm. And I think it's just a slight difference when you're coaching something that like you felt or you know, because it's true for you. Um, And I think uh, I just have like kind of a natural ability to like get that from in out. But that's where that comes from is just being really self-taught. Well, Mm. a lot of, I mean, a lot of that comes from there. It's like, okay, athlete A is doing X, I want them to do Y. What is the most effective and most direct path from 
X to Y or from A to B or whatever it is. And like, I guess like at what point do you, do you start to go further into the weeds? At what point do you identify that this athlete is not maybe the, maybe it's too simple or maybe it, they need a fur, more explanation. Uh, at what point do we, do you have to make that switch? And I guess, I guess this is a bit of a nod to the fact that as a coach, you need to have the range to do that. Right. Mm. That's, that's yeah, predicated range on the idea that like you can actually explain like, yeah, you want, we want to talk about, you know, external rotation at the hip and like, you know, why we drive our knees out when we squat, like I'll, I'll shoot, I'll muck it up with you. But, but like, at what point does that, do we have to go from one to the other? Or is there a, you know, it's obvious, it's obviously a spectrum to some degree, but like, you know, athlete is doing a, we need them to do B. What is the most effective way to get them there? You have to think about the application too. So if you're giving a like breakout to the class on like how to snatch and you want to hold external rotation of a shoulder and like show them what that means using jargon is okay from time to time. You just need to make sure it's very clear to everyone. It's when someone says one of those jargony terms, but doesn't demonstrate or explain what that means. It mm. just kind of glosses over the fact that everyone's going to know like what their pronators and supinators are. And it's like, no one does like soup. We haven't like no one has any clue what that is. <laughs> so there are times where that makes sense. But you know, the context that I'm thinking about more often than not is I'm coaching an affiliate class. This might be the only hour these people move the entire day. Do I need to have a, a dissertation on where your feet need to be in the snatch? Or I just need to say two inches wider, wider, good, move on. Like what is a more effective way to deliver that thing? And I think that's a underdeveloped skill for most CrossFit coaches, because when you go to level one, you're amongst your peers of people who have a, a similar interest level in what you're doing as you, and they might be all into the anatomy and physiology, but you have to know that most of your members are there to get sweaty, socialize and have a good time. Mm. They don't really truly care about that stuff. So, you know, having the range is important, but you have to know the application and the audience and when it is time to do that. And more often than not, your average affiliate member is a casual CrossFitter. They come in three days a week and just want to sweat and have a good workout. They aren't interested in the finer points of that. When you have an athlete that pulls you aside after class and wants to know more, that to me is the best time to deliver that extra information. Mm. But if I deliver that in class, like you just described, people are going to start tuning out sure. and then the class becomes less effective. And, you know, as soon as you start to lose your audience, you begin to lose the effectiveness of the workout because people are distracted and not in the moment. And that's just not an effective class, in my opinion. Yeah, I think you you, you choose to. I, I, we did uh, a <clears throat> workout with the push jerk. And it was just like the perfect opportunity to deliver like quarter extremity principles. Like mm -hmm. the push jerk is the ultimate, like, can you hold tension in your core and like let that power bleed out? And so in that class, it was like, I'm actually, even though this isn't typically my style, like I'm going to nerd out and we're going to use the term quarter extremity. Mm -hmm. We're then going to explain, you know, I was like, who's at level one here? You guys would love this. So it's like, are there any level ones here? And no one raised their hand. And I was like, well, there's this principle about quarter ex extremity. Does anyone understand? And like three beginners were like, oh, we know what quarter extremity. <laughs> and I was like, good job. Yeah, that was a good job there. Um, but mm -hmm. like, you, you just like look at your week and there's probably a day that it's worthwhile to nerd out and get into the weeds about something that like maybe if you did that all the time, if you're like, okay, we're going to talk about this principle, like people are going to tune out, but you like, you can find the one day a week and you're good at this too. Like mm -hmm. you'll do like whole like sleep things, you know, you'll look at like the time that we have. And I just like assess that this is a great day. There's enough things like we're actually going to get into the weeds on quarter extremity. Um, and I think that's just like an important part of like knowing the whole, you know, and picking and choosing. So I actually have a question for you then. What would be a practical way, like just as an example for someone listening, that you could explain cord extremity to maybe uh, a group that no simple. one had any idea. It's what's what's the way you simple. deliver that? So people can kind of see what we're talking about here because you have a very complicated like CrossFit key, uh, idea for like the average, you know, casual CrossFitter coaches get it. But like, how could you explain to that in a way that, you know, the lame man or lame woman would understand so that, you know, you're delivering yeah. the information you want, but at a level that is appropriate and helps it sink in. Yeah. I, I, I nailed it at six 30. I was so happy with myself. <clears throat> It was, uh, so I did the like actual quarter extremity spiel and then I was like, okay, let me highlight this. And then I had someone stand to the side and I went like that to their arm and I was like, okay, can we assess how much power was involved in that? 
And then I said, well, what if I did this and then did like a full Mike Tyson rotation yeah. that started in my core, power left my core and continued to my extremity. Do you understand that one is way more powerful than the other? Yeah. You, you have no choice but to say, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Cool. You understand core to extremity. Yeah. And I think that, but, and that, that's like, I mean, I love that, love that analogy. And I think that that's a good like example kind of from start to finish it's like so you understand like we understand what quarter extremity means from like you know what the what the manual so to speak says right. but then like so okay so there's a baseline understanding that the coach needs to have and then from there we can build on top of that things like the layers of like okay here's the punch here's the you know here's the two differences spot spot the core to extremity here right and then being able to communicate that so i think <clears throat> it's important to note it's not it's not necessarily having a simplified understanding of things it's being able to communicate them communicate it simply and, and making sure that we're not thinking of the term simple as in like these people are dumb or like people like I ah, this is way too far above their head because that that's not true I've had I've had done the same thing you know where it's a a conversation about something from you know CrossFit methodology or something like that and you'd be surprised at how many members may have actually dug into whether it's the L1 manual or some some journal articles and stuff and every once in a while I'll get a hand up that's like it's like, you know, that I, what's yesterday we had a good conversation about GPP. One of our new members was like, what's GPP? I was explaining like, this is our GPP day. This is the purpose of it. And one of our members is like, what's GPP mean? I was like, Oh, perfect. Who knows what GPP means? Like, unless don't, if you have an L1, put your hand down sort of thing. Yep. There's a couple coaches in the class and, um, yeah, so we had a good con, we were able to have a good conversation about it and, and explain like, you know, we try to have structure in the program from for for the purpose of like, hey, let's focus on something because if we're not focusing on anything, people people like to have something to focus on. So, um, but we obviously don't want to take the variance out of the program. So, explaining to people like, hey, this is this is the day where sometimes when you're putting the programming puzzle together. If there's too much that has to fit, nothing fits. So we have a little bit of flexibility in explaining to people like, this is how we get the variance. I want you to outrun the lifter and outlift the runner, you know, sort of sort of principle. So and all of that's predicated on the idea that you understand you have a depth and, you know, a breadth and depth of knowledge that allows you to understand and then extrapolate, maybe just pull out the the simplified version of all this stuff. Yeah. The, the way I like to think of it is very similar to the way they talk about like, once you feel like you've mastered a movement, start over. So like mm. when it comes to explaining something that's maybe higher level in the CrossFit class, whether that's finding power position, quarter extremity, whatever, you know, as the coach, you first need to understand what the hell that is right. and then figure out like how you would it create more of it within your class or more within your athletes. And then you need to start back at the beginning and go, all right, when I was brand new, how could I understand this? and notice that you might have a perspective or a background that's very different from your average member where you might have, you might come from strength and conditioning. You might have a background in sports. What is the easiest way to say this? So I always go back around and it's like, as you're developing as a coach, you need to educate yourself as much as possible and then go back to the beginning and think about how did I think about this when I was a beginner and how can I communicate this to someone when they are a beginner so they understand? So like going back to simplicity. And I think that's probably where a lot of coaches get lost in this is they start to feel figure out <clears throat> that what they're saying is very jargony and they try to go back, but they don't stay on top of their athletes enough with simple stuff to continue to make progress. So one of the things I challenge coaches to do once they've started to figure out what the coaching cues they like, come up with two different ways or two different ways for each of the style of cueing, verbal, uh, tactile, and visual. Think of two different ways for each one of those. That is very, very simple for everyone to understand. So like in your example, in the push jerk, if people aren't understanding that the punch thing, the punch thing is being missed. What's another thing you could say? Jump. Jump is again, super simple. Everyone knows what that means. And when you can use language like that, you've now started a baseline for how to create a change in a movement. And then you get a chance to refine. So I like to think of this is that you start super basic as you come back around with really basic cues and you kind of slowly build an athlete up over time as they are a member at your gym. Because I agree with you, Hunter, some athletes do really like to nerd out and want to know more and want to go into the weeds of like, tell me more about this. And like, tell me why it's important that I wear my lifting shoes on like squat 
cleans when I, you know, I see Rich Froning do it in his flats. Why do I have to wear lifting shoes? And we have those conversations and you start talking about like body geometry, you know, an Olympic lift or like bar path and Olympic lift, which for a lot of athletes is like, keep the bar close. But then you can nerd out more on that. So, like, I think having range is really important, but I really think it's important that as coaches develop their ability, they come back around at the beginning and think about it as themselves when they were beginners and how they could understand the thing to then hopefully explain it to somebody else that way. Because I do really find that listening to classes, even our awesome affiliate, people do a really good job of, of explaining things from what I would say is like a higher level. Now, if you're losing your audience, how do you fix that? You go back and you be a little more simple. One of, I think, an underrated kind of, so like coaches thinking to themselves, okay, how do I want, how do I like apply this type of thing? I think one of the best ways to do this is like, if you're not taking class, you're missing out on a huge opportunity to pay attention to the way that you execute this workout. I can't tell you like how, I, I can't tell you how valuable I think it is to be able to stand in front of a class and say, I did this workout an hour ago. This is what happened. This is what I, this is what I think you should do and how you, how I think you should, you know, execute the workout. Or if you're focusing on for me, like me personally, even I've been doing CrossFit for over, over a decade and I've fairly recently been really working on like retooling my squat a little bit. And the amount that you can kind of gain and learn about like, ah, like, Oh, I'm starting to learn to use, like relearn to use more of my posterior chain. I was a very, I'm a very quad dominant, like squatter and learning how to use more of my posterior chain gets me thinking like, ah, I can think of, I can think of three or four members where me do it by me doing what I'm doing now and kind of paying attention to it. I can actually like, I can now empathize with what somebody else might be feeling when they're doing these squats and are experiencing the same thing that I can. And then I can be like, Hey, like I get it. Like I've experienced something similar. This is something that has helped me. That's one of the like sneakiest ways that you can just like, there's no, no oversimplification required. It's, Hey, I, I was in your shoes either five years ago or two hours ago. And this is what I think, this is how I think you can improve. And then being able to communicate that to the athlete and distill it down to like something simple. I think coaches miss a lot of opportunities by, you know, if you're not especially doing like the same programming that, that your athletes are doing, you're, you're missing the boat. Yeah. And one of the things that I'd like to take from what you just said is when I was explaining yesterday, we had uh, a 10 minute email of practicing crossovers. When I was trying to figure out crossovers, which I did took a while to and just beat the shit out of myself with a jump rope. First thing I said to my class is like, Hey, remember when you tried to learn the jump rope the first time, how many times you hit yourself? Guess what? You're going to do it again. Kind of setting the expectation for like, yeah, when you learn something, you're going to take some bumps and some bruises. And that's part of course. Like, don't feel like you're the only person in the room that does this. I have also experienced this. Expect to fail a lot when you begin. And then I said to them, we're going to start with single unders as something, a reference point. They all know they all start doing single unders. And I'm like, all right, everyone put your jump rope down, put your hands at your hips where you jump rope. Everyone falls along. Now, where do you think your hands should be when your hands cross? Everyone crosses their body. I'm all right, we're gonna do something really silly. We're gonna do a dance. Cross, uncross, cross, uncross. I said, you know what I thought about when I learned how to do this? Two giant paintbrushes and I'm fucking Fantasia Mickey Mouse right here going back and forth painting the fucking landscape. And everyone's like, you, you see the tilt. And you're like, wait, that does kind of make sense. You look across the room, everybody starts picking this up. And you know, a room that might've had two people with successful crossovers, now we have 10 people doing it. And it's because the mm. cue was simple enough that yeah. people could visual, visualize themselves doing it to the point where like, all right, now it clicks. And that, to one of my favorite parts of it being a coach is seeing something simple like that play out on the floor. The simpler the cue is, the more easily and ready, ready acceptable it's gonna be for somebody else. And when you're starting out, one of the easiest things to think about is like, where else in my life might I do something like this? Or I've seen this before, whether that's a pop culture reference or just in your daily life. So one of my favorite ways, once you start to figure these things out, like what's actually trying to get changed, come up with the most simple and basic, the angry gorilla, two paintbrushes, whatever that cue is, make it relatable because then people understand. And one of the ranges that you need to have there is understanding who you are talking to and what they might be interested in and what might make them understand what you're saying. Because the two paintbrushes might not click for some people, they might need something else. But having the range to understand which cues are gonna work on what athletes is a huge part of what comes down to like what makes a successful cue when you're working with a large audience that's of wide ranges. Yeah, I think, uh talking about taking classes 
the amount of stuff <laughs> I've stolen from Coach Chris and some of uh, Coach Jack's like gymnastics stuff and you with warm ups because you're always pretty creative with warm ups. Like, if I didn't take affiliate class, like I would just be in my own echo chamber, like thinking mm. I'm sick. Oh but, yeah, like. You know, Coach Chris, all you guys like have just like absolutely blown my mind at times. And it's like the next day, like I'm putting that in. And if I didn't take class, I would never have that experience. Like I took a, I felt terrible because I took a Caroline class and she did like the best warm up I've ever done in my life. And so I looked at my roster the next day and I was like, well, there's no one from class. So I'm just going to do that same exact mm -hmm. warm up. Yeah. And then Sierra was like. This warm up's a lot like yesterday. <laughs> In your face, Mark. <laughs> 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 but yeah, like yeah, it was just uh, the the development of being a coach, like almost I don't want to say entirely because we do a lot of like evaluations and stuff and continued learning, but like it just comes from absorbing taking the classes. Like that's got to be the most important aspect of an affiliate. Definitely butchering this quote, but like doesn't that something like the, the best artists are like thieves? Isn't that something like one of those quotes out there? I think in the world, like in terms of like when you are trying to develop something early on and you don't maybe have the range, or you don't understand, like you watch someone else that's proficient at it and figure out like what about that was really good and then try to implement it on your own. So I did the exact same thing. I used to watch the CrossFit.com main site videos. And if they had any sort of coaching element to it, that's the part I'd watch like four or five times and be like, all right, like what's the simplest way? Yeah. And one of the things that I thought was great, there was a, um, during the CrossFit games this past year, they had K-Star deliver a, you know, a one RM snatch session with like an athlete. And, you know, everyone's probably expecting to hear certain things about power position and not. He literally spent the entire 15 minute video talking about her feet and nothing else. The entire video. And, you know, one thing that clicked for me there is like, why couldn't I deliver an entire class on snatching that's about the feet when everybody else is thinking about everything else that's going on in the world? Why not make one noticeable change to one very obvious body part for every single person? Make that the principal focus. And then when it comes back around a second time, I could pick something else to work on. And I think that's a really good way for a coach who's starting out to get comfortable with this stuff is to mm. pick one single element in class and be like, what is the most simple way to communicate this one single element? Because when you try to correct everything at, at once, you basically correct nothing. That helps, that helps athletes too, right? It's like, mm. if what, and I'm, I'm probably more guilty of this than anybody. It's like, okay, we're going to focus on this one thing or we're going to warm up this way. And it's like, okay, you've got an athlete who's w whether it's like just, you know, a, a complete train wreck sort of movement. And it's like, there are about 13 things to fix here. Trying to dial in on one of them is way more digestible for both you as the coach and the athletes. Like, okay, so we're going to prioritize the thing that is like, going to potentially cause injury if not corrected, right? So making sure that the safety element is kind of the first thing that we're prioritizing. But if all of a sudden you like, you give an athlete a correction, you take a lap around the floor, you watch their next lift, you give them another correction, you take, take a lap around the floor, you give them a different correction. It's like, all right, which one, one? Yeah, it's like one, maybe, well, first of all, consider the athlete is like, is this somebody who's like a, who's a, you know, a mess as far as like being, being hyper aware of their deficiencies, right? It's like someone who just gets, doesn't, it's like oh, coaches just hammering me with like the negatives, just the corrections, like everything I do is not right. Like that's, ob that's obviously has, that obviously has its drawbacks too. Even if you can, like you do have the knowledge to pick apart, like, yep, power position was bad. Bars popping away from you. You're not active in your turn, whatever, whatever series of corrections it may be. That's like, again, those, just stacking a checklist of things that you're doing bad or the athlete is doing bad, like that may do the complete opposite, right? Even if it's like, here's 10 things that you can correct. It's like, fuck, I have 10 things that I need to correct or I'm not doing this right. This whole thing's a waste of time. And so having the, you know, dialing in and like you said, for a new coach, that's a really good technique. It's like, hey, I'm going to pay attention to just for the most part where your feet start and where they finish today. Like that's the main thing I'm going to look at. And then maybe you do have an advanced athlete who moves very well and you could try to get into the weeds a little bit more with them. But having that one thing is one, it's just more easy for a coach, right? Because you're not focusing quite as hard on other things and two, an athlete like if the athlete knows that's what they're looking for that's what the athlete can focus on and maybe they do actually make a positive change to their movement because that that's the only thing that they're worried about and they are paying you know they are paying close enough attention to that and they're not worrying about the rest 
if it's overwhelming for you to look at an athlete, do a snatch and do whatever, 75 things wrong. And then you give them 75 things. They're overwhelmed by all those cues. So, you know, I'm actually onboarding two coaches at the Wyndham gym right now. And I can tell by watching them work the room that the gears are spinning, but they're not sure which single thing to attack. So they're like, man, I don't know. Is it, is it bar path? Is it I'm triaging? Is it the bar path? Is it the midline? Is it the feet? Is it the arms, is it the legs? And I, you know, I walked over to them and I said, Hey, pick one thing for today. Don't, don't worry about trying to fix everything all at once. Pick one single thing and make that your focus for your class. And recently the feedback from both of those coaches classes has been tremendous. People are like, man, class is so much different before. Cause I think they were apprehensive early on about saying the wrong thing because there are so many things going on that they didn't say anything. No, mm-hmm. other than like, good job, you're lifting weight. Like yeah. again, there is an element to class of making sure classes stay on task and they're motivated and you're giving them an attaboy, a girl, or hey, do this, do that. But f- but people are there to move better and get coached. It, cheerleading is not enough. So how can you help an athlete when you feel like all the things that you have to offer right now is just cheerleading and you don't know which thing to triage is most beneficial? P- just pick one for the day right? Don't get so wrapped up in, you know, this, uh, paralysis by or analysis by paralysis that you can't just jump yeah, in and right get to work. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> Words are hard. Yeah. It's, it's, it's way more beneficial just to pick one thing and hammer that and make that your focal point for the day. And then spend the time leading up to the next time it comes around being like, what can I deliver next time? And what's a simple way to say this, that, or the other. Yeah. I think it's, you actually disagreed with this point before on the last podcast. Ooh. But, Ooh. Like an idiot. Chirp. Uh, <laughs> gonna be your chirp. Idiot. No, uh, I think you both kind of did, but oh, Sherp was you, a little no. more vocal. <laughs> ah, um, fucking idiot. And so I think you have to, you have to trust yourself in the fact that, okay, so I'm coaching this person. I am the coach. If a seminar staff person were here or you were doing the evaluation, you would see these 10 things being done wrong. And I'm going to feel pressure to try and correct as much of it as I can, because that's my job is to cover as much ground as I can with a person in the hour. But if you coach people long enough, and I've been doing this a long enough time Like, I know that someone starts here, and if they trust me and we do this together, like, they're going to be here. So, so Jason, your snatch is not going to look like Maddie Rogers' snatch right now. And I'm seeing 15 things, but you're safe. And I know there's a tremendous amount of volume that has to happen before you are going to have, if ever, an elite snatch. So, I'm gonna choose right i'm acknowledging that i'm seeing flaws i may choose to kind of pull back because i trust where we're going instead of like well i'm seeing 10 things wrong and hunter's got his clipboard and he's biting his nails so things aren't going well so i'm gonna normal yeah you know and and, (laughs) that's what he's happy to and again like (laughs) i i just you know it's it's like just trusting yourself as a coach that you know where you're going with someone and that might require you pulling back like a lot of things and obviously someone has to move safe like that's the very foundation um but but i spend a lot of time kind of pulling back a little bit because we have so many examples of the gym of someone who moved like a train wreck. Like, is this even for them? Are they going to be here to like, Holy oh, what's that over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And like that belief and trust kind of like helps you coach. It's kind of seen it enough. Yeah, times. it's kind of funny. We have a, there's a group in the, I, I coach a few of the 6.30 PMs and we've got a group of like your, I uh, want to say like 35 to 50 year old women who come into the gym, not, you know, started as beginners at the gym and have been here for like a year or so. And it's kind of funny. I'm I like, I remember telling them, towards the end of the last the last time that we did like a snatch cycle i was just like i told i was like you guys are my like gleaming like sparkling examples of like i would send you into a weightlifting gym right now and feel comfortable that a coach would be like huh like that's they can do that that person like that person's caught me off guard like that person knows what they're doing like how the fuck do they know what the power position is and it's like and it's kind of fun. It's, it's like, ah, like got, I got, got them, like got one of them, but it did. It was like a super iterative process. And that's part of what I think what makes 
like the CrossFit methodology as successful as it is, because uh, I don't remember where I was listening to this, but it was something along the lines of like CrossFit is, or maybe I made this up. Maybe I'm a genius, uh, but <laughs> definitely, that. I think that's definitely, yeah, that's what definitely it was. the case. Um, but it's like CrossFit CrossFit's the, the, any, when you go to, if someone goes to school to be like an extra, and maybe you can speak to this a little bit as the, as the, lead i went to school for horticulture lead yes <laughs> that's, the, that's the lead d7 in the master's degree d, d7 triple backup that's right. linebacker that's right triple salesman. backup um Did but it's, 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 it's the idea that like when you're if you're creating a program as a let's say a sort of like a cscs or someone someone comes to you and it's just like i want personal training you're gonna make a you're gonna make like a eight to eight to 16 week program, or maybe even, maybe you go even longer and it's like, okay, but what happens after that? It's like, so you, you are qualified to create a X period of time program where you're going to focus on these things to help somebody pay who's paying you get a very specific result. But, but like what, what next? Like what's the plan after that? And I think what the, the difference is, is that why and why CrossFit's been so successful is the fact that like this isn't supposed to no end point. This, there is no end point. Right. And it's and it, it, it's kind of cool because like if you're using kind of the methodology, if you're using the constantly varied program, it should be the case that like today we're going to work on the snatch today. We're going to focus on a very specific component of the snatch. And three weeks from now, when we do this lift again, we're going to focus on something different. And three weeks from now, when we do that again, we're going to focus on something different. And eventually we're going to loop back around and we're going to focus on the same thing. And hopefully we've got more pieces of the puzzle put together, but it's still going to be this iterative process that just doesn't end. And Oh, by the way, in the meantime, you're getting really fit because you're just consistently coming to coming to class, right? It's not, there is no definitive end point. It's just, let's keep moving the needle. And maybe it's because there are so many fucking things that we teach and do, whether, you know, gymnastics, weightlifting, kettlebells, dumbbells, running, rowing, biking, skiing, whatever it is, there's something that can be taught in some way. So maybe we just, we just have so much shit to teach that we can, ne we never run out of it and we can always improve an athlete in by some metric. But, um, the idea that like, you're not going to fix everything all in one class should be both like kind of exhilarating and a little bit, a, like a little bit of a relief to coaches where it's like, Hey, I, like you said, we're going to make sure you're moving safe because I want you to come back three weeks from now for the next snatch day. But at the same time, I can't overwhelm you with the fact that like you are so f like, you don't look, you know, it doesn't look like an elite weightlifter. You don't look like, I don't know what movement this is, but we're going to just take a small bite out of this today and then another bite out of this tomorrow and another bite out of that three weeks from now and just keep progressing like that. The hilarious part about what you just said, and this might've changed since I graduated grad school is that when you take the CSCS and all those exams, it's literally 100% memorization. There is no practical application of your knowledge sure. with people at any point. You need to know how many chances there are someone has a stroke or a heart attack while exercising. You need to know exact physiology and anatomy and physiology and where the origin and insertion of the muscle groups are. How many members do you think you'd have at your CrossFit gym if you talked about origins and insertions of muscle groups inside of your class? One. I could hear our members being like, I got an origin and insertion for you. Shut yeah, up, exactly. Like, exactly. Everybody starts cheering. Yeah. Like, exactly. So for yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I always <laughs> joke that like I have a master's degree in exercise physiology because I actually do. But most of the knowledge that was gained during my two and a half years down in Pennsylvania doing that was on the floor of a CrossFit gym and on YouTube and reading books that I found interesting essentially nothing in my graduate degree, I would argue prepared me to be an exercise coach outside of the fact that the program wasn't rigorous and I had a bunch of free fucking time to hang out in a CrossFit gym. And to this day, I still believe that that opportunity while costing me, I don't know, fucking 70 grand to go to grad school, that's a lot of money to invest when you feel like the school itself didn't really provide you a lot of value. But what it did is it bought me an opportunity to figure out what I was passionate about and figure out a way to deliver something that I really believe in to other people. So when you're getting started with this stuff, like figure out what interests you, what movement, like you, for example, like I know you come right off the Olympic uh, weightlifting scene. Like that's probably your favorite thing to teach when you started teaching CrossFit. Yes. Yeah. And then what happened with the movements you didn't like to teach? Was there like anything you really didn't like to teach when you started? 
Yeah. Like what? Yeah, uh, I hated handstand push-ups. Tell me why. Like what, 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 what about it made you apprehensive or why you didn't like teaching it? Uh, I struggled teaching it because it is a semi-intuitive movement to a lot of people. And then you watch someone try and then you have to make this assessment of like, do they not have the requisite strength? You know, you're like really sure. starting to do some rat risk assessment. And uh, all I did, which is funny, like not to toot like Drew's horn, but I just watched YouTube and like headbutt knees. And I was like, oh my God, that's so simple. And then all of a sudden, mm. like, the tripod headbutt, headbutt your knees. knees fuck how do you do yeah, that yeah 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 no you know the cadence, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the cadence. Gonna, yeah yeah of course and then um, <laughs> just with like a little bit more exposure like i love teaching handstand push-ups now but it was it, uh, yeah i couldn't stand teaching them i mean first. i felt the same way about rope climbs until i heard uh, hunter say this and this is someone like i've been coaching i don't know crossfit to like nine years at this point but when you said you know stop on top of your own pinky toe when you're crossing your feet over like i've always been the guy like all right we're gonna go teach rope climbs i'm gonna be the dipshit that says lock your feet and then slides up the slides down the rope the second i say here's how you do it and then yeah. immediately not do it. <laughs> so like stuff like that is really important. But what you just described are three body parts, the sequence they go in. And yeah, there's more nuance than just saying head, butt, knees. But like those are identifiable body parts. People know what they are. They're easy to move. And when you determine they're appropriate, uh, like fit enough to try them, it's a pretty easy way to describe it. Right. And you can do it step by step. So in addition to having very basic cues, like you start to figure out like, what is the best way to deliver these cues? What is the order of operations that makes the most sense? Cause like, you know, we'll teach the tempo snatch or the clean and jerk. And it's like, all right, where do you start? Start with something basic. Start with a body part and tell where that body part needs to go. That, that's as easy as it gets early on. And then you start to layer those things on. Yeah. So how many times did it take you before you felt confident in that delivery of the headbutt knees? Was it just that after watching those videos, you do one class and then it's good to go? Or no, no. You know, the how first long? one's kind of shaky. Yeah. I would say probably like four or five classes of trying to do it. Wait, and then, so four or five hours is all it took? Well, dude, you know, the you know, it, it's the same thing with like ring muscle ups. So there's just some movements that people need to have the expectation that like, you're probably not going to get one today. Yeah. And then you can get pretty defeated as a coach. If you go through that a couple times with no one getting a ring muscle up handstand push up. But when you see the light bulb go off in someone's eyes and they get their first handstand push up or they get their first ring muscle up, like your ability to just like kick in a door, be like, I can fucking coach this shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, like changes exponentially by just the belief and what's, you know, nothing changed. My progression didn't change, but because like I was empowered by seeing the light bulbs go off in someone else, like all of a sudden your delivery gets a lot better and you're like, this shit does work, Yeah, you know, and that, that's it. I mean, I do think it's a huge part of it, like confidence in what you're delivering. Like if you don't sound confident, you're like, I don't know, maybe move your feet. I think like, yeah. that's not a good cue. But yeah. if you say, put your head on the floor first, once your head's on the floor, put your butt on the wall. Mm -hmm. All right. Once your butt's on the wall, put your knees down to your chest. Once you get to like, confident with that delivery and people can tell that you know what the hell you're talking about even if you're faking that shit at the beginning yeah. like that's another thing coaches should try to you know you should learn as much as possible but when you're figuring this stuff out you're brand new like it's okay to like fake it till you make it i mean i would say right off the bat when i started coaching like a lot of stuff i did was literally regurgitating what i had just watched on youtube three hours before and a lot of faking until i made it and then before i knew it like it became something where i'm not like oh so and so says i'm like no nah, i fucking said this you put your head on the floor put your butt <laughs> on the wall bring your knees to your chest and like that is a element that i think coaches are gonna have to kind of go on their own journey and accept the fact that at first you will feel like an imposter yeah. but you can say that for literally anything any endeavor that you start, yeah. you are an imposter when you begin and you develop proficiency through practice. And what you just said was like, yeah, four or five classes. That's probably a total of about a hundred out, like a hundred minutes total. Cause it's like 20 minutes of class on each one of those things. Like yeah. that's not a tremendous amount of time. If you're just willing to fucking take a swing, which is what you had to do. You had to be willing to take a swing, which is another thing I think prevents coaches from doing it is they're like willing their their unwillingness to be, you know, vulnerable and be like, I don't know what happens to the day that this doesn't go right. Yeah, I think to, to both both of your points form kind of one interesting thought for me that's like, so you're concerned about maybe not being not either not knowing what you're saying or not being sure if it's going to work. And you're explaining you're saying like the difference between having like basically speaking with confidence versus kind of the uh, a certain level of 
timid, timidity, tim- timidness, whatever being timidity. Tim- it sounds timidity. like a word I would use. Timidity. No, I'd say timidity <laughs> for yeah, sure. Yeah. Keeping it simple. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but it's, it, so it's like, Hey, we're obviously not going to, we don't want to be in a position where you're so, where you're belligerently overconfident about something and are just like at all costs where you, you know, wrong. you're going to listen to me. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to confidently lead you off the cliff here versus, <laughs> and then what you're saying, Mark is like, okay, well I need to, there's a certain level of confidence that I need to have and communicate to the athlete. The thing is, is like the athlete doesn't necessarily know what you don't know. So like as a coach, especially when you're like, if you are either, teaching something new or you've got a movement that you're teaching a different way or something like that. I, first of all, I think athletes who have been in your class often enough will like, ultimately like we have a lot of things that we repeat. Like if you're a member who comes to 5 PM, you're going to hear a lot of head, butt knees. You're going to hear a lot of like, let's, we get behind the bar for our toes to bar. We bring our knees to our chest, that sort of thing. But if you start to maybe wander down a different path, trying to teach somebody something different, one members are going to acknowledge that. And maybe they pay a little bit more attention because they're trying to gain something out of it. What they're not doing is looking for like trying to listen and find like the error in what you're saying. Right. Right. Because ultimately like they're there to learn and saying being and speaking with enough confidence. That's like, okay, like, yeah, I'm going to give this a shot. So you've got something new being taught by someone who's pretty confident about it. The athlete has the opportunity to take something new, maybe that uh, or from a, from a position that they hadn't thought of before. And you're also kind of, you're also learning a little bit as well. Like you're kind of mapping some new space as far as like how you might be able to teach something. And a lot of times like bumble fucking your way through that sort of thing does teach you like, Oh, what like, was missing? Yeah, what, what, was either what was missing or there is something that does click with people and it's like, oh, I can build off of that cue. Like now I can rely on things that I know and I can I can build off of, you know, build off of something else. And to kind of your point earlier, like or whichever one of you said the stealing things from other coaches, I guess it was you. It's like, first of all, like there's like less than 1% of the population is actually truly creative and like comes up with original thing. Everything else that I'm not original. Come, yeah, I'm not originally, <laughs> I'm not a creative person. Uh, like there are very few, I, I know very few people who are genuinely creative. Um, and that, and that's just a fact. That's just kind of a fact of life. Everything else is sort of built off of, things that you already know, which were taught to you by some, someone or some, some external source, nothing that you necessarily came up with. There's nothing wrong with regurgitating something from someone else, assuming that you understand like kind of the basic element right there. Don't fucking skip that part. You have to understand it or at least attempt to understand. And if you don't understand it, spend the time learning that. Otherwise, eventually that that theory or that cue gets a a hole poked in it. And next thing you know, you might get caught with your pants down and like, don't get me wrong. There've been per- times where I'm like, I don't know the answer. Let me get back to you. Like I've said that in class. Well, you said that be vulnerable. And I can't tell you how comfortable I am telling someone, I don't know. You know? <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I don't leave it there. Sometimes it's, I, I don't know. I didn't really see that. Let's look at another one. Or I don't know. Let me think about that. Like if mm. you have this urge again, who are you coaching to the person in front of you or this like mythical uh, staff member that I keep thinking about? Um, it's you me. know, it's okay to just be like, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Let me think about that, you know, and give them an actual substantive, substantive. We're making up all kinds of words. This podcast right is going word? great. This podcast uh, sucks. Sponsored <laughs> by Sherm's Dictionary. But you can get one on Amazon. Giving, am I giving something of substance or am I just spitting out something because I feel like I need to have an answer for everything, you know, and like you need to be vulnerable. Well, what's cool too is that you can get an opportunity where you take another coach's class and you hear a cue and you're like, ah, well, let me see if I can one up them in the, in the ease of understanding category. Yeah. So like just use Caroline's example. I love the way that she coaches toes the bar because one of the things she says is she says, get your shins parallel to the floor when you're pushing down on the bar, basically knees to chest, but she's just saying it another way. So I was like, I like that. But what if someone doesn't understand geometry and what the fuck you know, parallel what's, what's is? parallel mean? <laughs> hmm, parallel, never been there. Um, so I said, bring your knees to your armpits. What mm. does that accomplish? shins parallel to the floor. And I was just like, here's another way to take someone where like, maybe I feel like I'm stealing someone else's like cue or thing and not giving credit. Eh, I'll just change it a little bit and try to see if I can find a way to make it even simpler for someone to understand. And as soon as I said knees to armpits, 
everybody's in the same position they were when Caroline was saying shins parallel to the floor. I'm like, all right, add a little kick. Oh, look at that. Some new toes to bar for a bunch of people who had never done toes to bar before because they had always heard like knees to chest, which often means like knees to belly with feet still miles away from the pull-up bar. But as soon as you bring your knees to your armpits, Mm. oh, look at those feet. They're about a foot away, a little little kick. And there you go, toes to bar for the first time. So if you're a new coach and you're trying to figure out like, how do I start, start somewhere? Listen to someone you respect and like, like their information and ask yourself, how could I make this simpler? And for me, it was just knees to armpits. Everyone knows what their knees are and what their armpits are. I mean, that's, that's basically how, like how I learned and really like I learned kind of in the similar way that you did and kind of when all of the the like misfit coaches kind of like really started getting into the weeds with like coaching and, and, and working with whether it's competitors or just kind of like just getting into the weeds of coaching rather than thinking like, Oh, this is just kind of a fun thing to do where I get a gym key. Um, it was, just it was YouTube. It was just like, mm-hmm. oh, I like listening to this guy talk. I like listening to the to Glenn Penlay talk about you know talk with Donnie Shankle and John North, yeah. Cal Strength, and like I can learn like weightlifting from these jamokes. Like I can watch Carl pa- Carl Paoli do do the gymnastic stuff and I can drink Bud Light and wear jean shorts. Yeah, yeah. And like I can like K Star K Star kind of tickles the like the the deep into the science-y, weeds, yeah. the really sciency kind of like oh you got to be on on your shit to to be able to digest what he's spitting and so like just finding like you said finding people who who speak in a way that you understand or that you enjoy listening to and just you just fucking go down that rabbit hole as far as you can until until it takes you somewhere else but and, and the best way to do this if you're a nurse in front of a giant group find a friend who might be interested in getting in shape find a friend and teach them yeah. like literally find one other person who's like man i'm sick and tired of being so x like they want to just change in some way that in, is revolving around physical fitness and getting healthy and help them and then ask them afterwards, like, did you understand? Or just watch their body language. You'll be able to p- pick up really quickly whether or not they're making that change. Right. And then you get to learn, is that cue effective? And if you, you know, don't have that friend and you're, you know, a coach in a class, then maybe it is a bigger group than one single person. But it's basically just touch points. The more often you get a chance to practice, you get a chance to refine, you'll quickly have a playbook of things that are really effective and then things that are effective for a certain audience, things that are effective for a different audience, and then things that are like only when I'm around my like fellow coaching buddies that we might talk about these type of things, like you know, what zone two means or like anything of that nature that might be a little higher level. You basically just have to know your audience and then just practice, 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 because that is the biggest determinant, I think, in helping athletes eventually get what you want them to do, which is change the way they're moving or how they're you know attacking the workout. Yeah, I think you also, if, if something's going to be effective, which I think was what we're talking about, like how can you be as effective, as simple as possible, it also has to be like really fun. Mm. And I think we always go over this, but like you kind of have to picture yourself as like a semi entertainer, you know? Like, sure. like if. Oh, I think foundation- it was like a performance every time. Yeah. That's what like I think. That's what I think of coaching. You're on, you know, like you got to be funny. Like uh, with the push jerk, I do like a, uh, you have a flag pull up your butt that connects to the back <laughs> of your shoulders, right? Because as you dip down, like if you have a flag pull up your ass, like you can't go up this way. <laughs> you know, I'm like. What happened to you in middle school, Mark? Uh, <laughs> Tell us what happened uh, to you in middle school. Right. And this is exactly <laughs> what happens. <laughs> There's like a ha ha, like a, a few seconds of tornado, and then the lights go on, and you tell people, "All right, we're gonna do thumbs on the shoulders, dip. Think about that flagpole. Do you think anyone is yeah. pitching forward? forward? No, well, they're the, not. The, and it's, it's funny, right? And that's like got to be kind of like almost not for everyone. Not everyone's a, a comedian, yeah. but. Well, I mean, it's exactly how I cue the, the kettlebell clean. I, I mean, gonna, I'm going to be like yeah. a child right now and I'll explain it. Right? I'm like, before I go down this uh, this tangent of how we're going to learn this movement, I'm going to apologize. I'm a 12-year-old crass young boy here with this cue. Thumb to butt, Pledge of Allegiance. And everyone's like, what the fuck did you just say to me? <laughs> Thumb to butt, Pledge of Allegiance. I'm like, all right, bear with me. Everybody, grab your right arm. Thumb to butt. Everyone instinctually hinges over. And then I say, stand up and do pleasure. Put shoulder in internal rotation. Yeah. All the things I want them <laughs> yeah, to do. Yeah. They're internally rotating, arms close to their body. Every part of what is needs to happen in a sound kettlebell clean is happening in the hinge because I say thumb to butt. Then I say, stand up and do the Pledge of Allegiance. Where does the kettlebell want to go in the front rack? Almost the same spot your hand would be when you're doing the Pledge of Allegiance as a third grader. And all of a sudden, people are like, oh, I get it. And while there's still some nuances there and people still hit themselves with the kettlebell for a handful of reps, People start doing that. And I, because the cue is funny, 
it's rememberable. And right. that's what's really important yeah. is it now sticks in their brain. Next time that comes up kettlebell cleans, we're gonna hear that stupid joke about thumb to butt and Pledge of Allegiance, but it gets everyone moving the way that you want, which is more important than you showing off the fact that you know that when an arm is in extension, it needs to be an internal rotation. When it's yeah. in flexion, it needs to be an external rotation. People don't give a flying fuck about that. Right. Some do, very few do. But what is a way to explain that is is funny because it's nice to have the room being engaged and you're more likely to get adherence if people are engaged in your class. If they're fucking falling asleep because you're boring, like that's another problem coaches can have too with being jargony is it puts people to sleep. So yeah. like, can you find ways to be relatable? And I, I agree with you, Mark. I like, if I have an opportunity to make a joke about something or make it a little bit more fun, I wanted to because what's the best way to create adherence in your gym? Make it fun yeah. and make it effective. If you have a really effective gym with no fun, you're not gonna have a lot of members. You'll have really hardcore members, but you won't have very many of them. And if your gym's only fun and not effective, you're also gonna have a lot of members because people are gonna come up, sign up for a few weeks, get hurt, get burnt out and not come. You need to have both of those things kind of firing at all cylinders. So that's like something I think about when I'm delivering a cue is like, can I, can I make this cue fun to follow along with so it's not like 18 steps and I just talk to you for five straight minutes? like. We literally said thumb to butt. Everyone does it and freezes. All right, cool. Let's do it a few times. So everyone gets it. And you just make it digestible enough. And then people are like, all right, fuck. Next time a kettlebell comes up, thumb to butt. Yeah. And again, that makes it funny. It makes it something. Oh, remember last time so-and-so like ripped a fart when we said thumb to butt? Like <laughs> something stupid like that happens. But you have these things that help make the community tighter, which then makes them want to come back to their gym. So you have the more opportunity to the touch points like you talked about earlier, where now when movements come around a second, third, fourth time, we build upon those and people get better and better and better. And the only reason they came back a second, third, and fourth time is the last time they came in, they had a good time. They got a good workout. The, the thumb to butt thing, I was, before you <laughs> went on that tangent, I was going to say like the last, we, we coached it, we had that, the kettlebell clean in the program like a week or so ago or earlier this week. Um, and I was like, as I was teaching, I was like, so like I overheard Sherb's class this day, this seemed to be the most memorable cue. So like, here we go. Like thumb to butt and sure is like, Shit, sure is the giggles. fucking day is long. <laughs> it's like, everybody's figuring out that, you know, it's like. Instead of me saying, we're going to put our shoulder in internal rotation. It's like, get it, coach. Fucking idiot. I legit said, like, like hey, uh, this uh, seems uh, borderline inappropriate, but it's Sherb approved, so here we go. We're sticking yeah, yeah. Thumb to the Don't butt. use that as your standard. That's what I said. Don't use that as your standard. My um, I would go most appropriate. It's pretty wide, wide, wide ranging. One of, the, I think that's one of the less egregious like things that I've said probably, some belligerent things for yeah. sure. But again, a big take home here is that like it was memorable. It got people doing what we're doing. That's really the like the test three tests and something like this. Yeah. Do you create the change that you're hoping to sure. change? And if you don't, pivot, find something else. You know, I can't even tell you how many times I must have watched a video on like how to teach the clean and figured out 15 different ways to explain the exact same thing. And then, you know, you throw the ones out that are less effective or you just be like, all right, I'm saving this for next time this comes around for this athlete or for that athlete that I know that will respond to this. And that's a, a big part of this is just like, as you develop your bank of cues, you start to prioritize or like rank order, which ones are the best ones to have for this population, for this group, and just know when that has to be. And then if you don't, if you strike out, you're not a bad coach. You just had a, you had a bad session. And even I, to this day, will have cues where I'm like, oh, I really thought that was going to fucking hit crickets. Yeah. It happens, man. It happens. But you have to be willing and like I said, vulnerable to keep doing it over and over again, because how else would you develop that repertoire of cues? Gentlemen, final thoughts. Uh, you need a you need a break there. Yeah, Just I've been talking for like an hour. Bit. I think uh, I'll start then. <laughs> yeah, I think the coming from the I would say the side if there's a if there's a fence where on the one side you've got the extreme simplification on the other side of the fence you've got the the more cerebral scientific explanation approach I I would fall on the latter side but. Um, I do think that there's a lot of value in as a coach, you have to, you have to be able to go onto that side of the fence with, with your members and doesn't, and not even necessarily in a conversation, but you just have to have that bank of knowledge at your disposal. I remember I was reading in, in preparation for the L3, I was reading through a lot of the old journal articles and I came across one that was on like more of the anatomy and physiology side, talking about the difference between like abduction, adduction, flexion, extension, all kind of the basically, basically terms that you would want to be able to tell an athlete, like, I want you to put your shoulder into flexion. Okay. Or whatever. And theoretically the athlete knows what their shoulder is. They know what flexion is and they know how to get there. And the, 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 
it was it was actually a Glassman article where he was like, you're useless if you can't teach your members that and they can't recall it. Because part of what we're doing is part of what should be the goal in the CrossFit class is some degree of education Agreed. and understanding that some people some people want that more than others is is perfectly fine. And maybe you will never be able to teach, you know, Bob what shoulder flexion actually means or looks like, or he'll never be able to actually do that. But there is value in teaching members and just treating them as if they're intelligent humans who are capable of learning that sort of thing and, and having the kind of the breadth and knowledge to do that. I think there's a lot of value in that. And, you know, the, it was like, you're, you're useless if you can't communicate basic foundational movement patterns, movement, you know, joint movements, manipulations, that sort of thing to these members because again if the goal is that they're going to be here for a really long time like imagine how much you could teach somebody if there's just a little bit a little you're teaching something that's a little bit outside of their wheelhouse like you know every day or once a week and all of a sudden they come here for they're there for two years and you've got 104 different cues that you've given or you know you've taught somebody because once a week you've pulled out the a little bit of the nerd handbook and now this member has a much deeper understanding of what they're doing and maybe that actually helps a different movement click it's like oh i remember when coach said i'm lacking internal shoulder rotation and when my when my when my elbows bend when i go do bar muscle ups i wonder if those things are related and it's like it's like yeah actually like they are they're super related it's like why do i always get injured in this place it's like well if your movement pattern is this and you know basically having the knowledge to maybe connect those dots also makes a smarter athlete and hopefully one that you know ends up coming back for long periods of time. So we need to make sure that you're living kind of on both sides of that fence equally, but you have to be able to go well, you know, into, into one backyard or the other from time to time and, and live there for as long as it takes to, to communicate. Like you said, if we want an athlete doing this. How do we get them most effectively and efficiently and safely from A to B? What do you got, Mark? Yeah, no, I mean that covers. You just gotta have range. That's like the the thought is you need to be able to go to both places if you're one or the other, and all the time it just doesn't work. You gotta learn as much as you can, and you have to be relatable. You have to make mm -hmm. what you're saying to the athlete relatable. If they aren't interested in it, or you're making it in a way they are interested in understanding it, it's not a valuable cue. Which means not one cue is gonna work for every single person. So the more range you have, both in your knowledge base, but also in how you deliver the cue realizing that some people aren't going to be able to look at you and figure out the fuck you're doing. Some people aren't going to hear you and know what the fuck they're doing. Some people aren't going to be able to feel where your hand is outside their knees. They push your knees out in the squat, figuring out what the most effective cue is a big part of this. And what's awesome about the CrossFit gym, if you continue to make it fun and the workouts challenging and effective, they'll keep coming back and you get more and more touch points and more and more opportunities to figure out and kind of whittle down what is the best way to do this? Because there is not one single cue that is the most effective. It is the, what is the most single effective cue for this athlete today. I like it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to another episode of the Misfit Podcast. You can head to teammisfit.com or the Sugarwad Marketplace to get signed up for Team Misfit affiliate programming. You get a two-week free trial on Sugarwad. Also, if you didn't know, we are on StreamFit. Um, new platform, but combination, gym management software and program software, but we have, uh, we've recently put our, put our programming on StreamFit, so if you're already a gym that uses that, um, you can you can switch over or if you're you know looking for a new new platform uh they've been great so far but you can find that program on teamisfit.com the sugar rod marketplace or the stream fit marketplace not totally sure what they call it but anyway sounds right marketplace yeah, yeah. sounds about right we are in roughly the middle of our baseline training phase probably like a third of the way through our our 16 week baseline training phase it's not too late to jump in at the end of the day the affiliate program is a general physical preparedness program. There's no one, there's, there are certainly, there's always a better time to jump on than another, but there's certainly no bad time to jump in. If you're looking for a change, if you're looking for something that has kind of the, the thought put into it, the, the, where we kind of, we're think when we're having these conversations, we are thinking about how these conversations get applied into our class. And we put that, try to put that kind of knowledge base into the programming. So, um, if you're not a subscriber, you can head to teammisfit.com, get a two week free trial, get a free sample of the program, uh, and see what you're see what you're missing. That's it. See you guys next week.